being able to actually sit on the other side of the table mm -hmm. and being able to listen to what the fund is looking for, what they actually checking, all these due diligence checks that, you know, I treat it a bit lightheartedly, I'd mm. say, before. It was an absolute eye-opener. I have seen the change in the landscape, mm. how the funders approach certain things. Again, the pot of money is is limited. Us, as the third sector, we become more competitive. There were instances where I thought, you know, I can't believe this has just happened. It creates more hoops for everybody. My colleagues uh, from, from NHS would probably echo that as well, that sometimes the money goes to something that is completely counterproductive because there wasn't that involvement of people on the ground from the community to actually say, this is what we want, this is what we need. Welcome to another episode of the Leading Communities podcast, a platform where we help to develop discussions on topics vital to local communities, offering insights from both leadership perspectives and the community's viewpoint. Join us as we explore the issues, stories and experiences that shape our communities and inspire change. In this episode, we'll explore the local landscape of nonprofits and charities, examining the current state of funding opportunities and how to navigate them effectively. I'm joined by Elizabeth Cardinal, who has been in the UK since 2004, but during that time has really developed a diverse career spanning education, interpretation and community support. Her roles include the Head of Ethnic Minority Achievement Centre at Warsaw Schools, the Strategic Advisor on Migration and Equality at Rights and Equality Sandwell and Community Navigator at the West Midlands Violence Reduction Unit. Additionally, in 2013, she founded the European Welfare Association, CIC, running a major Polish supplementary school in the West Midlands. Elizabeth also serves as a trustee for the National Resource Centre for Supplementary Education and the Federation of Poles in Great Britain, and more recently has become involved in assisting in the commissioning of an, uh, of an underspend for grassroots organisations, and that's really helped us to hone in on some of the themes we're going to talk about today. So thank you for joining me, Elizabeth. Thank How you are for you? having me. I'm okay, thank you. Now, drawing from your experience, both as a strategic, strategic advisor and as a commissioner, what would you say are the most common pitfalls that you see in funding applications and the way that organisations approach the funding arena? Um, there is a, a, actually a quite a big variety of reasons why um, the third sector NGOs are struggling at the moment. There is a lot of competition mm. and I think I would name that as probably the main reason why a lot of people get um, a no answer from the funders, sadly. Right. Um, there's more technical side of things uh, where people don't do their due diligence checks, they don't, you know, uh, make sure that they've got everything in order. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the first things that the funder will check. So, you know, my advice to any NGO applying for funding is number one, make sure that your paperwork is all fine, correct, everything is submitted on time. Um, the certain clauses in memorandum of associations are done properly um, and more importantly talk to the funder, engage with the funder, mm. build a relationship with the funder. Um, I certainly notice in my career standing on the other side of being an, you know, an organisation that uh, provides a, a, a really wide range of support to the community. Um, I have seen the change in the landscape, mm -hmm. how the funders approach certain things. So historically, um, funders such as National Lottery, which obviously is the largest funder in, in the UK, mm. uh, would not engage directly with an organisation, whereas now they actually encourage uh, people that before they apply for funding, it's almost this approach, talk to us first, let us know what you want to do, we will try mm. to help you to navigate you. So. Um, so th there is a lot of support out there, there mm. really is, so that's... I would imagine cool. though for mm -hmm. smaller organisations, for grassroots organisations, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily have a lot of resources, mm -hmm. but then will require these types of arrangements to keep them sustainable. What would you say is a very good starting point for grassroots organisations when even just thinking about actually we might have to engage with funders as part of our business, mm -hmm. what's the foundation? 
Uh, you know, there is not a one straight direct route and it all depends in terms of what you want to do, whether you do it on your own, which often is the case, whether you've got perhaps a team of people involved in, um, you know, shaping that idea process organization. Uh, but what we do have um, in Sandwell, we've got um, SCVO, we've got a same equivalent in Walsall called One Walsall, we've got uh, Birmingham, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, um, equivalent of that. And these are really the umbrella, this is an umbrella, example of an umbrella organization that is set up specifically to provide that guidance support uh, for newly formed organizations as well as those that are established so mm -hmm. um, they would be probably the best place to go to um, particularly around setting up the organization from a legal structure from having the business plan and model you know drafted and getting that um, valid advice uh, from professionals who work there so you know um, don't try to reinvent the wheel mm. just go and ask questions and do your homework again and look around and see what's there mm. and ask just ask for help you mentioned earlier that there's a lot more competition now for yeah. maybe the same pot of money and one of the things that's important is for people to engage with funders are there disadvantages as well as advantages to them getting involved with or engaging with a funder can they you know, get it wrong or shoot themselves in the foot if they don't do it the right way. <laughs> I, you know, yeah, to be honest, you know, uh, my personal view is that it all comes to down a personal relationship that you've built mm. with, with everybody around you. Mm. Uh, as simple as that. We're all human beings and we all have got our preferences and we all have got our thoughts and ideas, you know, cultural biases. I think we have to be honest about it. Mm. Um, in terms of competition, and again, that is my personal view based on being involved in community work for the last, um, well, 20 years effectively since I arrived, is the fact that I have seen quite a significant increase of new organisations formed, particularly around 1919, 1920, mm -hmm. so fairly recently. So we're talking about organisations that might have been running for the last three, four years. In right. some cases, they are really, really new. Yeah. Um, established themselves perhaps a year ago. Um, and that's all great. That's that's fine. But what um, makes me really concerned is actually how the landscape is changing in terms of when people decide to go off and do their own thing. Um, rather than thinking about something really unique, what they end up doing they copy others and right. um, and that's where we've got a situation whereby the NGOs become um, disfranchised mm. uh, fragmentalized mm. and weakened mm. um, because there is a difference between you know imagine that I run a shop selling shoes and you work with me and then all of a sudden you decide to open a shoe shop next door mm. to sell your own shoes you know what does that achieve you know what yeah. we end up doing we end up being in competition mm. rather than you thinking about oh if she's selling the shoes perhaps I should be selling bags or clothes you know and then let's try to work out the way how we can actually build a mm. partnership or alliance because that's when we become stronger mm. I can't see that at the moment there is a huge appetite for people particularly women you know which is really interesting mm. because in that line of work I see more women being involved in setting up their own enterprises and businesses and community interest companies and that's another legal structure as opposed to the CIOs or the, the you know uh, charities mm. registered with a charity commission um, which, you know, again, shows a great appetite, shows a great potential. Um, however, on a more strategic level, mm. that is going to cause us a problem. So, and what the funders want to see is, have you spoken to one another? Mm. Have you come to a conclusion how you want to work together rather than applying for the same pot of money doing exactly the same thing? Yeah. It's not going to work, is it? Yeah, no, no, indeed. And I think you raised some very valuable points there. You have been running um, your organisation and been part of leading a number of others for a long time. What advice do you give around making these organisations more sustainable? Mm. Well, this is a tough one because I would be lying to anybody to say it was an easy thing for, for us to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, 
I remember moments when, you know, um, me and the closest sort of circle of friends who helped to shape what we've got now, uh, we're almost losing faith, hope, and we were going through all ups and downs. And I suppose what kept us going uh, was the passion for serving the communities and the mm -hmm. fact that we didn't do it for us, we did it for others. Yeah. And that was the actual strength of the organization to allow us to come out um, from you know various ups and downs that we experienced within uh, organization. Um, but the advice I would give to anybody is like, just do your homework very, very carefully. And as I said, if you've got an idea that is really unique, that you can, it's, it's almost like, you know, I always compare the NGOs to that pig in the middle because we're not the private sector where you've got a lot of corporate competition, you know, that dog eat dog kind of, you know, um, sort of, I don't know, f culture mm -hmm. because, that's what's there and everybody knows about it. There are no surprises there. There's not a public sector which perhaps provides people with more security around the pension and like having that, you know, nice job that I do from nine to five, which I know it's not always the case. So I don't want to, you know, sound too sort of, you know, uh, critique of that because obviously there's lots of great colleagues in, in that sector that I know uh, they do it with a passion and a lot of um, heart in, put into it. Uh, but the the third sector, the NGOs, are neither but both at the mm. same time. So when you set up, when you think about a starting that sort of um, piece of work, you have to be prepared to make a sacrifice. You have to think about it as a business, but at the same time, you have to put other elements into it mm. in that big melting um, sort of, you know, pot. Um, so it's not easy, but mm. uh, unless you're unique, unless you've got what it takes and you've got that passion and enthusiasm and you're driven by something bigger than just your ego mm. and the uh, need of earning money, then you perhaps in the right sector. If you do it for your personal gain, forget it. It's a waste of time. Fair. And I think <laughs> that's a very good point. Um, you've gone from, I suppose, being applicant in some respects to commissioner. Mm -hmm. How did that change your perspective on what's needed? Right, okay. I wouldn't say I became a commissioner because or, obviously my yeah, being experience part of being, the commissioning part, process. being part of the commissioning yeah. process. Um, well, I have to say, and if um, the CEO of the Heart of England happens to, to hear it, um, then I again wanted to say a massive thank you to Tina Costello, who's the CEO of Heart of England, because it was through her passion, her vision, and being really an inspirational leader, I have to say, it was an absolute pleasure to be part of those panels mm -hmm. that we've sat on when we were distributing the nine million pound of underspend after the Commonwealth Games. It was, to me, it was an absolute eye opener. Mm -hmm. You know, being able to actually sit on the other side of the table mm -hmm. and being able to listen to what the fund is looking for, what they actually checking, all these due diligence checks that, you know, I treated a bit, you know, lightheartedly, mm -hmm. I'd say before. Um, but also asking lots and lots of questions, you mm. know, additional questions, doing checks and actually understanding how it works um, helped me to appreciate um, why perhaps we got rejected on so many applications in the past, uh, what we need to look at and what we need to change. Mm. Um, but above all, it's it's just incredible experience of of being able to now see the full picture which i think you know mm. is is a good place to be yeah which doesn't change the fact that the competition is growing and the money's getting tighter and tighter and it's actually brutal yeah. it's actually quite brutal you know that was one of the things that i have discovered particularly over the last 12 months i'd say um seeing others drifting away and and deciding to do their own things and i think that was uh, a bitter disappointment for me personally, professionally, mm. as mm. well as uh, personally, because I invested a lot of pe um, time and effort in, in building people and supporting them. And just to learn that they just turn away and walk away doing the same thing that you do mm. makes you feel frustrated, <laughs> yeah. to say the least. You know, it's like, you know, good luck to you, all the best. But what you've just done, you've weakened our sector. Yeah. We could have worked together, we could have built something stronger together. You've decided to do something on your own. 
and you know, wish it all best of luck. Mm. And time will time time will tell. Indeed, how it will turn out. How though would you? Because you raise a very valid point there, um, and I've definitely seen that happen in other settings as well. Where, mm. as you say, somebody goes away and just completely replicates something, mm. and in doing so almost weakens the collective without realising it. But how would you sort of suggest that these organisations look at fostering partnerships instead? So rather than going away and replicating, instead thinking about a way to work with. Mm -hmm. And that's another tough one, because mm. when you think about it, it really goes back to ego and insecurities in people. Right. Um, and I think it's a personal choice of, of, of a person. Uh, I think if a person knows their worth, if they know what they're good at, and, and they've got that passion and that drive and their priorities are mm. set right, then you'd, we don't have to worry. We, we wouldn't be sitting here and discussing this today, okay? Mm. It would be a matter, okay, what can we do? How can we work together? It would be a normal thing to do, to say. Um, Whereas I think it's when people see you, uh, learn from you, because they see you as a successful, you know, community leader, um, uh, you know, entrepreneurial mind, et cetera, et cetera, all great. And just because you might m make it look easy, of course, it doesn't mean it's easy yeah. at all. Uh, but I think people become um, delusioned at some point, you okay. know, and I think I think that's what I, I, I would get it down to their egos. So mm. again, within the third sector, when we talk about working with communities for communities, the word I always use because this is who I am is I am here to serve. Mm. Whereas I have seen quite a lot of people coming and going. If I was to mention the organizations that um, you know, uh, came about and then disappeared, mm. I wouldn't be even able to, to, to give you all the names because there were so many of them. Mm. Um, and it's a shame because all it creates is the confusion then amongst the community that mm. needs that support mm. now even more than ever before. Um, so it's, yeah, there isn't a straight answer to it, but I think you, we have to start from ourselves, look yeah. into who we are, what, why we're here, why we want to do what we want to do, and then, you know, again, ask questions, um, learn, but be honest as well. I mm. think that's another thing. Honesty and loyalty in this sector seems to be non-existing. Oh. So maybe mm. I'm losing my faith in humanity. I hope momentarily, um, <laughs> I hope it's not forever. Uh, but yeah, at the moment, it's really brutal. And, and I've experienced that within the organization, personally, professionally, uh, from um, a range of people. And, you know, I had to go back and rethink the whole thing in mm. terms of the strategy for the organization and thinking, okay, if all you can do is to kind of push me out or tell me not to do something because you want to be the one to do it, or you just blatantly copy what I've been telling you or mm. not, you know, then I'm doing something wrong perhaps. So maybe I have to be um, in a different place to them. So that's what I choose to do personally. Right. So okay. I, I, I have got, um, and you have to have a vision. Yeah. And you have to have a vision and you have to have those qualities of a leader that would allow people to see that in you and follow you. And I think we have to accept the fact that not everybody is a natural leader. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be because you can still be a successful person professionally uh, doing work within the sector. But, you know, for goodness sake, do you really have to call yourself a director? D do you think that's really what you need? You know, mm. but some people need it for personal reasons. So that's up to them, I guess. When you think about the environment that you mm. are operating in um, and that the organisations are operating in, does it create damage then with the funders who maybe mm. they themselves start to struggle to know who to trust and in a way that can then impact everybody in the arena, including maybe organisations like yours that have been around for a really long time? Well, I think you know the answer to that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> By the way you ask that question. Unfortunately, the answer is yes, because mm. we're all human beings and, you know, 
funders, although they have got, uh, you know, people who they employ to do all those checks in the background um, and regardless of how many years of experience they might have mm. and how well um, sort of connected they might be in terms of knowing what's going where, none of them have got that crystal ball. Mm. <laughs> and unfortunately, um, every now and again, there come people who are not necessarily the most honest people or mm. doing things not necessarily as they claim to do it, right. okay? And it's one of those things like, you know, w anything you do in life, you know, you kind of learn to take that risk. Um, and, and I think, you know, genuinely, you know, all the funders um, are trying to be as fair and um, as, as it's possible, of course, Again, there will be advantages and disadvantages to what a, a well-established organisation with a you know um, reputation can do compared to that newly um, sort of you know funded mm. established organisation. Uh, so there is that argument within the sector, you know, to allow those newly. Uh, established organizations to, to give them a chance and yeah. and and you know and and the the re reality is that you know there's so much need mm. from from all the communities and when we particularly in the context of what's happening currently in the country you know on the dreadful riots etc that just shows how much more we have to be doing yeah in terms of working together and building those alliances and partnership and, and supporting one another. Because I can tell you, even if I multiplied myself by 10, mm. I still would not be able to do everything that's needed to be done. Mm. So we need more people in the sector. Um, I just, I'm not convinced if we need more directors for directors' sake. Yeah. We need people with vision, with passion, people with driven by that passion mm. for serving the communities. Um, and the funders will try to do the best they can. Um, but again, you know, like in well, well, everything in life, and uh, you know, th th there will be instances where they might discover after a while that perhaps, you know, that pot of money they have given to that organization wasn't as best spent as possible. But they've got the, the ways of dealing with it. So, you know, they wouldn't be granting a huge amount of money to an organization they didn't check and didn't work mm. with and haven't had that relationship with in terms of knowing that what they say on the paper they will deliver. Yeah. yeah. Does that make it harder though? Because when I ask the question, it's not a case of does it make it harder? How does it make it harder mm -hmm. for say then organizations like yours or other well-established organizations mm -hmm. that come in off the back of those bad experiences mm -hmm. that funders have? Does it reduce what becomes available to you? Does it make you have to jump through more hoops? Uh, it creates more hoops for everybody, Right. absolutely for everybody. And I think that's what a lot of people don't realise, that the fact that uh, organisations such as ours that's, you know, quite well established and and has received, um, you know, um, some significant pots of money uh, from, from, from funders um, as well as from, from the local authority. Mm -hmm. um, but again, the pot of money is is limited. Yeah. And um, so, so it creates problems for all of us. If anything, it damages the sector because obviously then, you know, us as the third sector, we become more competitive. As I said to you, it, mm -hmm. it almost feels brutal at some, uh, you know, that there were instances where I thought, you know, I can't believe this has just happened to me. You know, I, I, I just really had to, you know, sort of sit down and process mm. um, what, what happened. Um, but then, you know, it's it's for the funders or for the local authority, they will be then asking lots of questions. So ultimately, we're only prolonging the process then of, of obtaining the funding. Mm. Um, you know, it's then making, because obviously then there will be ways of trying to make sure that that doesn't happen again, mm. but that, it's the time yeah. and often we don't have the time we mm -hmm. haven't got reserves to keep us going to provide a service to the community um, and wait for 
the funder or for the local authority to decide how the next pot of money will be divided okay mm -hmm. there's also an issue of um, you know proportionality that's one of the things I have been raising particularly here in Sandwell uh, with the local authority um, how can we ensure that the pot of money that's actually available to the third sector how can we ensure that pot of money is distributed proportionately because it's not equally you know mm. it's it's I think that's what people get confused about that you know um, it's it's that approach that you know one hat fits all it doesn't of course yeah. it doesn't um, and so there's a lot of, I think there is a lot of mutual effort that needs to go into it mm -hmm. based on mutual understanding of those needs, those communities, and above all the willingness to actually work together. If we can put aside our differences, if we put aside our political views, our biases, um, and our ego, again, shall I mention that? then I'm sure we can come to a really good uh, conclusions and we can produce really great outcomes, mm -hmm. even if we've got limited resources. Because I, you know, I've always said, I know money's there. Mm -hmm. And it frustrates me because I definitely have seen money being spent, particularly, I'm, I'm sorry to say it, but the public sector, you know, uh, public health, etc. And I know my colleagues uh, from, from NHS would probably echo that as well, that sometimes the money goes um, to something that is completely counterproductive because mm -hmm. there wasn't that involvement of people on the ground from the community to actually say this is what we want this yeah. is what we need okay yeah. but if you've got five people on the ground shouting give me the money because I need that money now mm -hmm. then you know as I said all it's going to cause is the confusion amongst the sector as well as the funder so I don't think we need that. <laughs> Indeed. But all the same, you are here, you are still pushing forward. What makes you optimistic about what the future could be? Again, I, I would go back to the vision and passion for doing it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if you asked me 20 year, years ago, would you like to, to, to do what I'm doing today? I would probably look at you and say, you must be crazy, okay? <laughs> you must be absolutely, <laughs> utterly mad. So I think because it's installed in me, I've been discovering myself through that and mm. actually trying to become a better person through that process. Um, and, you know, I'm a person of faith. Mm. So despite of all those obstacles thrown at me and, um, and my team that's that's with me um, I know my job is to 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 push harder and to keep going and never give up and I think I'm lucky in a way so despite again of all those issues that we have had to face we were able to overcome that um, because the core of our foundation is very, very clear in terms of serving, mm -hmm. serving with passion. What we've created 15 years ago um, with Agnes, who's my other director, we did it for our children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everything we did was for our children. Yeah. So we set up a school for them because we wanted them to, to be able to speak the mother tongue, to remember who they were, preserve the culture, traditions, the whole identity, and actually see both our children going through the whole process of everything we've done, and now being then being volunteers for many years in, in the school setting, and now working with us because mm. they don't work for us and doing little projects and actually taking it to the next level what we've managed to create uh, over the last 15 years is a legacy it's a huge legacy nobody ever can take that away mm. so even if I said okay I'm done <laughs> it stays okay it's still there. so I've done my work all I can do now is to pray to God that I've got enough health and strength to carry on with giving mm. and the rest is I suppose you know in in his almighty hands so mm. I hope. Elizabeth thank you you've given me lots of insight there and, and really shared with us I think a, a, a realistic picture of what the current landscape looks like and maybe what needs to be considered in order for it to flourish and move forward in a positive way and please do continue doing the great work that you're doing. Thank you it was a pleasure to talk to you thank you for having no, me. A real pleasure um, I do hope that you come back for another Leading Communities podcast uh, like this one you will continue to hear insight 
and on the ground knowledge about how things can be improved it seems that there really is an appetite for fostering more positive partnerships and for more individuals like Elizabeth to come together in order to achieve more together rather than trying to compete. I, th I think we're definitely in a space where collaboration is now king. So I hope you get a lot from that in the same way that I did. And please do come back for another Leading Communities podcast. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to keep up to date with all things Leading Communities.